Welcome to uh, the first orientation lecture covering the course LGLA 1351, better known as contracts. During this first lecture, we're going to focus on the syllabus. So I'm going to actually get out of this. This is the PowerPoint presentation and flip on over to the syllabus. I have in this copy of the syllabus highlighted or yeah, put into yellow certain parts that are especially important. I guess all parts are important, but some are more important than others to uh, paraphrase Orwell a little bit. Um, the version of the syllabus that you see will not have these sections highlighted, so I encourage you to uh, print up or pull up uh, electronically a copy of the syllabus and annotate it as you feel appropriate to capture these most important sections. Also, before we get started, I suggest that you put me on pause and go ahead and get some notebook paper or perhaps even a spiral notebook to take notes. Uh, this is a fairly long orientation and you're not probably going to want to listen to it more than once. Uh, I'm giving, going to be giving you lots and lots of information though to uh, hopefully make this course as successful as possible for you. And what I don't want you to have to do is, you know, you forget a certain one. Well, Groover said something about this during the orientation, but I can't remember what she said, and then you end up having to rewatch a lot of videos. My suggestion instead is to take just a bit more time and uh, take some careful notes in, while you are watching the orientation. That way you'll have your notes and you won't have to worry about watching or listening to this presentation more than once. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the, the, uh, depending upon the semester that you're taking the course, the, the syllabus may be different in terms of the actual dates or things like that, but the parts of it will be very, very similar. On the first page, really the only part of the syllabus that you're going to be that interested in, honestly, is going to be the withdrawal date. Um, this will be the withdrawal date whether you are in or whatever uh, course you're taking if it is a semester long course. In other words, a 16 week long course if this is during the spring or the fall. If you are taking over the summer, it would be any summer three or 10 week course. That will be the withdrawal date that you see on your copy of the syllabus. Now, this is an important date to be aware of because if you decide, let's say, in early March that, gosh, uh, you've won the lottery, you've decided to retire to the south of France, and you're not going to be taking any more paralegal courses, well, it would be smart to go ahead and drop the course before you uh, move to, to France. Um, if you wait until after the date, in this case the date is March 22nd, it becomes quite a bit more difficult for you to withdraw from the class. Now certainly I hope that you don't want to withdraw from contracts, um, but I know that things happen in life and sometimes that is a good choice for students. But please don't withdraw because you don't think you're being successful in the course. Um, I'm glad to pro provide some additional support. Many times I have seen that students may think that they're doing poorly in a course when in fact they're doing quite a bit better. So if you're not sure how you're doing in a course, please don't hesitate to, to talk, talk with me. Give me a call during my office hours or stop by and I can give you a sense as to where you are in the course and also provide some support so that you can be successful. Nothing will help have happened in the course by March 22nd that we can't work through and get you to a place where you can be successful in the course. Okay, let's continue on. The second page of the syllabus has a lot of technology information. Um, so we're going to fly by that and then we'll get to the section where we talk about the instructor specific information. You'll see we have my particular office location. My office is in the library building on the Frisco or Preston Ridge campus. Uh, depending upon how you'd like to describe it. It's on the second floor room 232. Below that are my office hours. Um, I typically have two types of office hours. One is your traditional office hour where I'm actually in my office in the library building. And you're welcome to come to my office hours and physically be present there. Or you can call during my office hours. If you choose to call, my telephone number is down here. Another way, though, you can participate in office hours is via Zoom. These are virtual office hours. What you'll do is you will 
go to, um, if you are, have an Android phone, you will go to this link right here. You'll click on it and you'll go into a room, a virtual room, where you can um, participate in office hours with me. I can see you, you can see me. We can share documents over our computers or smartphones or whatever we happen to be using at that time. If you use an iPhone, then there, this is the way that you go about um, accessing the, the, the Zoom virtual office. Right now, I'm actually using Zoom to tape record this, conver this uh, uh, lecture, so it's a, a very user-friendly tool to, uh, to um, use for these purposes. Um, I've never had a student who has been unable to use Zoom, but things can happen and let's say you do encounter a problem. Feel free to email me during my uh, virtual office hours and we'll figure out what's going on so that you can be sure to meet with me and get the information that you need. In addition to my traditional office hours like I have here and I have sorry, that I have here, sorry, and that I have here. Sometimes I also have my office hours in different locations. You can see in this particular semester, I'm having office hours in the associate faculty office in LH. LH is a different building than L building. LH stands for Lawler Hall. It's also on the Frisco campus. Um, it's in the same classroom, excuse me, same building where most of the paralegal classes are on the Frisco campus. I do it here because there's a class immediately before that, excuse me, immediately after that class. And many times students find it more convenient to stop by my office hours if it's in the same building where the class is. And so that's why I uh, make my office hours there from time to time. So always be sure to check when you see the office hours, the location, and also the way that I'm having the office hours. Okay, so let me go to the next section. Here's some contact information. As I said before, this is my office telephone number. It will work when I am right here. Obviously, it won't work when I am here, and it won't work while I am Zooming because I'm going to Zoom almost always from my home. I am in my office very little time. I work a lot of hours, but I don't work in my office a lot of hours. I mainly work from home. I've got kids and other responsibilities, and so it's just more convenient for, you, for me. As a result, my telephone number isn't that helpful outside of the office hours. So in this case, really... You know, it'll be about an, two hours a week where this is a good way to reach me. Here we go, here and here. Um, so instead of leaving me a voicemail, if you don't catch me during those times, a much better approach is to send me an email. Now, please don't misunderstand. I do want to talk with you. I love to talk with students about uh, career plans or opportunities uh, that we can work on to improve your performance in the class. Um, so sending me an email doesn't mean that we won't talk. Well, I'll be delighted to set up a time where we can chat by telephone or face-to-face -to, -face, um, to resolve whatever the uh, issues are that you're confronting. But this is an easier way to schedule, a, schedule those times. If you leave me a voicemail, it might be several days before I get back to you. Let me also share something about emails. There's really two ways to communicate with me via email. The first is actually going to work, and that's using this email address, cgroover at colin.edu. But there is a second way you can attempt to communicate with me. And if we see here on Canvas, let me go back to home so you can see that um, location. There is a box over here called Inbox. This looks really tempting. Click on it and you'll be able, actually we can't click on it right now apparently, but ordinarily if I wasn't in student view, um, you'd be able to click on this and we'd be able to send messages back and forth. Lots of students like this, lots of instructors like it. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. I do not happen to use this tool. And unfortunately, I'm not able to turn it off for the class. So it's there, but please don't use it. I'm gonna ask that you pause me right now and go ahead and write down in your notes, do not use the Canvas inbox. Um, it's not really relevant why I, I choose not to use it, but, but just maybe it'll help you remember a little bit better not to use it if you know the reason why. Many of my students, I would say over half, take more than one class with me. And so I like to keep all of the messages that I've shared with that student in the same location. And that helps me make sure that um, if I've shared something with a student or he or she shared something with me in the past, I can find that information as, as we go forward. And so uh, by, doing, by sending it through email, I can organize that information in one place. 
the inbox system ties that message that I got from the student to a particular class. So let's say Bob is in my class this semester. He's in contracts, we'll say, and he sends me a message about some issue that has continuing importance. Um, then three semesters from now, um, Bob reaches out to me and I need to do a little bit of refresher on what that issue is. Well, I'm going to have to remember what semester Bob took contracts and that Bob shared that information with me in contracts and not in intro or some other course. So what happens under those circumstances, I end up looking in several different courses before I find Bob's notes. It's just not a very efficient way of uh, filing the information. So uh, be, for that reason, I ask that you send things through the uh, cgroover at colin.edu. Because I don't use the inbox, I don't even notice if there are messages there. So you could send me a message at the beginning of the semester, and I might not see it throughout the course of the semester. Obviously, you sent me the message in the hopes that I would see it, so the way to, to ensure that you will have your message seen is by sending it to me at cgroover at colin.edu. I'm a little compulsive about my emails. For those of y'all that have sent me messages, uh, probably 90% of the time I respond uh, within minutes of the student sending me an email message or very, very quickly. If I'm in class or asleep, for example, I'm not going to, but I, I'm uh, pretty consistent about responding very quickly. If you don't hear from me within 24 hours, it probably means that your message somehow got lost or mislaid or something along those lines. The one uh, time, though, that you might not hear from me sooner is if you send me a message over the weekends. Um, I am not handy over the weekends. Uh, my family and I spend most of our weekends in a remote location in a lake house. Um, we do not have cell phone reception. We don't have internet. It's intentional. We don't want to be uh, using technology during that time. And so um, from Friday afternoon through Sunday, if you send me a message, I probably won't see it till Monday. And so uh, you're welcome to send me the message, but just keep in mind that when you want to communicate with me um, or you think you might need to communicate with me, better that you do that probably sometime on Thursday um, or early, early Friday to make sure that you get that response that you need. Or it may, if it keeps until Monday, then that also works. Here is our textbook, The Law of Contracts and the Uniform Commercial Code. The author is Tepper, and the current edition, I believe, is third. Um, you uh, certainly can buy the most current edition. You can also buy an earlier edition. I'm not aware of the author having uh, made dramatic changes to the content of the textbook, so that's a way to save a bit of money. Um, other approaches to save money would be to rent an electronic version of the book, or perhaps to share the book with another student. There are no open book tests or anything like that, so sharing a book with, a student, with another student can be a smart way of reducing the cost for this course. Of course, you can also sell the book at the end of the semester, so those are some things to think about. Um, if you do happen to choose to buy an earlier edition and you're concerned, well, you know, I want to make sure that I'm, uh, my, my, my chapters are correctly ordered and all that good stuff, uh, please feel free to come by. I'll be glad to provide some support for you to make sure that you are, in fact, reading the right chapters and you have the right content in the chapters. Let's talk about grading information. Here is a breakdown of how grades are calculated. You can see that we'll have a discussion board and that will be worth 5% of your grade. And then we'll have assignments. And we'll have an assignment for every chapter and that will be worth 30% of your grade. With respect to the assignments, each assignment is actually worth 32 points. So within each assignment is an opportunity to earn two additional points of credit. Um, we will also have quizzes, and quizzes are worth 20% um, of your grade. Um, we'll talk more about how you access assignments and quizzes in a little bit when we get to um, uh, the, uh, the, another portion of the presentation. Um, and then we have the midterm. Midterm is worth 20%. Final examination is worth 25%. So a little over half of the course is tied up with um, tests, and the other half is uh, activities that you'll do on a chapter basis. Before you get bogged down, though, into the specifics of the course, we have an orientation quiz. This is intended to be <coughs> a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a 
it's an easy quiz for one thing. If you are paying attention and listening to the orientation material and reviewing it, you'll do great on the orientation quiz. If for some reason you don't do well the first time, you can take it up to three times um, during the, the course of the semester. Let me just show you where you'll find that orientation quiz. I'm not seeing it here. I'm going to have to track that down. By the time I do my next lecture, I will have the orientation quiz up. I apologize for not having it visible right now. I probably turned it off for a second. I forgot to turn it back on. By the way, um, while I've taught this course um, for, this is not our, my first semester teaching it, um, invariably there's going to be moments where uh, things have been changed or, or things along those lines. So if you see something that isn't the way you expect it to be, uh, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email uh, sharing with me what you think might not be the way that it is. I'll look into it and if it ends up that you're right, I'll make the change. And if it's not, I'll give you a little bit of an explanation uh, to hopefully clarify what you're seeing. So that's always a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, we're on a, we're a team here. This isn't an adversarial situation. so. Uh, we ought to uh, be available to help one another out to make the course as successful as we can. Let me go back to the syllabus. Um, let's talk about how you participate in the discussion board. Well, you will actually um, have two posts that you'll do for each discussion board. The first is a substantive post that you'll make and uh, then you will reply to one other student. Now you can make more than one reply post, but you're only required to make one reply post. In your first post, which I'm calling the substantive post, you'll need to list your word count and you'll need to, end, and you'll need to for that word count to be at least 100 words. If you don't list your word count, you're gonna get an automatic deduction. If you don't have 100 words, you're gonna get an automatic deduction. If you say you have more than 100 words and you really don't, that's going to be a disciplinary proceeding. So don't do that. If you can only get to 90, um, write that you only have 90 words. You'll get a deduction, but a, a minor deduction on discussion board is essentially not going to affect your grade. Your second post needs to be at least 40 words long. You don't technically have to count or, or do the, the word count for that, but you certainly can if you'd like to. Let me show you how the discussion board is set up. So I'm just going to go to an example discussion board. The first discussion board we have is um, in chapter one, and it's just an introduction board, so I'll open it up here. You'll see that um, there are um, instructions about how to do it. So there's a little reminder within the context of each discussion board, so you don't have to remember how many words you have to have or things along those lines. The instructions will be with the discussion board. Um, and so here I have an example of how you might make a post here. So. Um, I uh, respond to the prompt, I am Professor Groover, I, I am drawn to paralegal studies because I find the law very interesting, to me the law is a puzzle, yada yada yada, go on to the end, then you can see at the end I include the word count. And then I pretend that I'm responding to somebody in the class, and you can see here I have more than 40 words. I don't list the word count because I don't have to for the second post, but before I finished posting it, I did count it. So here are some, uh, here's an example about how to proceed. So how do you make your first post? Well, the first post you won't, until you make your first post, you won't be able to see any of the other posts. That's so that you don't cut and paste some other person's creative endeavors and uh, subtly change it and, and claim it as your own. All you have to do is just click on this reply button to get started. So even though it's your first post and you're really not replying to anything, you are gonna hit reply to start. What you're basically doing is replying to the prompt that we have. So that's what we do for the discussion board. We'll have a discussion board about um, every other module. I think it's generally going to be on the odd numbered modules.
Okay, so let's talk about the examinations. We'll have two examinations over the course of the semester, a midterm and a final examination. You'll have two ways that you can take the final examination in the midterm, and you don't have to, to do them both the same way if you don't want to. Um, most of y'all, perhaps even all of y'all, will choose to use the Collin Testing Center. Um, and even here you have some choices though. What I will do is I will submit the test to the Frisco a testing center, the one in Founders Hall. It's a computer-based uh, test, so you won't need a Scantron or anything. When you go to the testing center, all you'll need is your student ID. A driver's license will not work for identification purposes, so be sure you have that student ID. And you'll go ahead and take, take the test. If you take in the Frisco Center, it's easy peasy. I've submitted it there. There's not going to be any problems with you completing the test. But let's say you want to take it on the uh, uh, Plano or the McKinney uh, Testing Center. That's also fine. Let me tell you how that's going to work. Um, when I turn in the test, I'll be turning it into the Frisco Center, but I will also alert the Frisco Center that um, it should be shared with the other testing centers. Most of the time that happens seamlessly and students are able to take the test on whatever campus they want. Every now and again there's a glitch. I'm not sure what happens that causes the glitch. Maybe it's someone at the Frisco Center, maybe it's someone at the other centers who misfile it or, or whatever might happen. But every now and again, uh, somehow or another, the test doesn't get set up in the other location. For that reason, before you go to take the test at the Plano Center or the McKinney Center, I encourage you to call ahead. Hey, I'm Bob Smith. I'm going to be taking the LGLA 1351 midterm or final exam. Just want to confirm that you have it. Um, if you're planning on taking the test on Tuesday, you probably should call ahead on Monday just to make sure that it's there. If it's not, then of course you can um, ask them. Uh, here, here's some strategies to do if they say, don't know what you're talking about. The first strategy is just to say, well, I'm, I'm, my instructor definitely made it available uh, to, to all the testing centers. Would you mind checking again? You wouldn't think that would work, but more often than not, they find it once you urge them to look one more time. So that's one possibility, but let's say that doesn't work. The second possibility is to ask them to contact the Frisco uh, Testing Center and to resend it or to maybe send it the first time if there was an error in the transmission. That should solve the problem. But let's assume that the testing center is uh, not able or willing to do that. Well, then at that point you can get me involved. But I want to give you a couple caveats. Um, if it's over the weekend and I'm at my lake house, I'm not going to be available. So you'll want to make sure that you've gotten all these issues resolved well before the day that you want to take the test. That's especially necessary if you want me to get involved in it. Of course, at the end of the day, it doesn't really make a difference because let's imagine it's that weird scenario where you're planning on taking on the Plano campus and somehow or another they don't have it there and they're not willing to uh, to call the, the Frisco campus to, to have it sent, be sent over. Well, what are you going to do then? You're going to go to the Frisco campus. I mean, it's a 30-minute drive. There's not a major issue associated with doing this. It may be inconvenient, but it's certainly something that you can go ahead and accomplish. So don't spend a lot of time worrying about it if there's a, a glitch along those lines, although you certainly can reach out to me. Uh, so that's how it's going to work if you choose to use one of the Collin testing centers. The other choice is to use um, ProctorU. Um, the midterm and the final exam have to be proctored, but they don't have to be proctored in a face-to-face -face setting. And ProctorU is a remote proctoring service. There are some things, though, that make it um, sometimes a little problematic for folks, and I want to be candid with you about some issues that can come up. The first issue is that it is something that the student pays for. It'll be anywhere from about $9.50 to about $31.50. Um, so it's not a free service for students. Um, many times what initially draws students to use the ProctorU is they think to themselves, oh, I can save some gas money or I can save some babysitter money. 
probably proctor you if you're local proctor you is probably gonna be more expensive than whatever money you would have saved now obviously if you're in a different city let's say you're in Houston or you are in San Marcos or um, College Station or something like that you may well find that well yeah it would be cheaper to use proctor you than to travel all the way up to uh, Collin County so there can be financial incentives but for most folks it's not going to be helpful from a financial standpoint Okay, so that's the first thing, the finances. The second thing is you need a computer that is compliant with what a proctor you needs in terms of its system. That's usually not a problem. As long as that your computer is reasonably recent, it's going to likely meet the requirements. Um, the one challenge can be is that you do need a webcam. Um, but beyond that, your system is probably not going to be problematic from that perspective. If you do have children, you will need to have somebody taking care of them because they can't wander in and out of the testing room. Obviously, if you have teenagers or you know 12 year olds or something that won't be an issue but if you've got little kids um, you obviously won't be able, your test might take an hour and a half and you won't be able to count on those those uh, kids staying in a different room while you take the test unless you have uh, some uh, some adult there to kind of uh, watch over them so how do you make the request for proctor you well you need to make it before uh, more than 10 days before or at least 10 days before the test window opens. So let me just show you on this syllabus when the test window opens. The test window opens for the midterm and this resume on this um, excuse me on this uh, uh, um, semester on March 18th. So that means that you would need to contact me by March 8th. For the final examination, the window opens May 13th, so you need to contact me by May 3rd. If you contact me on May 4th, it's too late to take Proctor U. If you contact me by May 9th, March 9th, it's too late to do the midterm by Proctor U, although you can still do the final examination via Proctor U. The reason that I need 10 days notice is that you need to do some stuff and I need to do some stuff, and Proctor U needs to do some stuff. It's not an automatic process. We need to have some conversations, some emails back and forth, um, and I need to um, work with Proctor U to do a few things. So um, we all need to kind of work together for this goal. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, Proctor U sounds like a good deal for me, what you ought to do is pause me right now and write me an email right now. Go to that Colin, excuse me, uh, uh, send me an email at cgroover at colin.edu. Make the request right now, so now you don't have to worry about it. Okay, if you aren't interested in it, equally good, most folks aren't, they're just gonna use the testing center. Let's go on and continue talking about, um, so we've, we've completed the discussion about the examinations. We've talked about Proctor U. Here is the actual syllabus here. You can see we're, at, we're in our first week, so we're going to cover the course orientation. And then we also have a chapter to do this week. If this is a long semester, meaning it's either the spring or the fall, most weeks you're going to have a single chapter. If it's over the summer, it's very common to have two, sometimes three chapters that you need to cover over the course of a, sem over a, course of a week. But even during the um, long semesters, we have some weeks that will have two chapters. This one, for example, this one, for example, and then there'll be one down here. So um, there's a lot to cover over the course of the semester. Be sure to follow this to make sure that you're covering all of your particular dates uh, along the lines here. So I have the wrong date here. I apologize. I'll make that change right now. Okie dokie. So now I'm going to flip and talk and go to the um, syllabus, excuse me, to the canvas. Apologize for that. I am going to go to home. So this should be something along the lines of what your canvas looks like when you start. The first module will be the start here orientation module. And you'll see here that we have, I probably don't have this uh, syllabus turned on, but the syllabus will be right up here. Um, when it is ready ready to go and you can see we have this PowerPoint We'll go over the PowerPoint in a few minutes But let me just show you some highlights before we go into the PowerPoint. This is a cheat sheet This is probably the most important document in the orientation other than the syllabus You will be using this every week because it lists what you have to do every week Let me go ahead and click on it and you can see and it gives it to you in the recommended order 
read the textbook, answer the password quiz questions. We'll talk about that in a second. Watch the video lectures. Watch the other lectures that may, excuse, the other videos that may exist in the module. Uh, do the discussion board. Complete the assignments. Complete the chapter quiz. Um, think about the vocabulary and grammar topics. So all of these are kind of a checklist of things to do, and this kind of makes things n nicely formatted. Now, do you have to follow this order? Not necessarily. You might want to do the discussion board, at least your first, your substantive post, earlier in the week. That's a great idea because that way you can, um, the, more, the, the more substantive posts we have earlier on, the easier it is for folks to reply to it. So you don't have to follow this order specifically or, or in a very, uh, a lockstep manner, but this is a good way to approach it. And again, here is some information about the uh, proctored midterm and a final examination. You can click between here going next and previous, but I'm going to go back to the home place so we can see where we are. Here is Here are some FAQs. I'm not going to go in detail. Many of these I've already answered. See if there's anything here that I will want to talk about. Extra credit. I do have some extra credit available in the course. Um, as I said before, the assignments. Each one of the assignments has some extra credit associated with it. In addition, we have the extra credit LinkedIn activity. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. It's also not unusual for me to provide additional extra credit. If you want a credit beyond the stuff that I've already posted, you're welcome to reach out to me with a suggestion. The things that have to be true about your suggestion are going to be these. It has to be something that everybody has the opportunity to do, and you have to give uh, me and, and the rest of the class significant notice. So if it's, say, a presentation that's happening tonight or tomorrow, that's not enough notice for folks. But if it's something that's going to happen in a week, then that would be an example of something that you could say, hey, why, can I get extra credit for this? And again, I'm not guaranteeing that I'm going to give extra credit, but um, that is certainly something that um, I'd be willing to entertain um, And if you let me know. What's not that helpful, though, is for you to say, can I get some extra credit? Come with a proposal, and I'll be glad to consider it at that point. Let's talk about some strategies that might be helpful in terms of using Canvas. You know, we've all dealt with technology and sometimes it can be a real bear to deal with. Very, very frustrating when things aren't going well. It's happened to you, it's happened to me, it's happened to us all. And there's few things in life more frustrating than that. Here are some strategies that are worth your consideration. And of course, the problem with these strategies are um, you're not going to have access to this PowerPoint unless you can get inside Canvas. So what if your problem is you can't get inside Canvas? There's something circular about that, right? So my suggestion is to take a picture of this or to write down these various strategies or to print up or download, print out or download this particular PowerPoint or just maybe, or this particular FAQ um, or this particular page of the FAQ. So you'll have this information available. Um, so these are things worthy of, of you taking notes, pause and, and take those actions. Let's talk about them. One way is just to restart your computer. Maybe that will solve the problem. Another thing would be to try a different browser. Google Chrome is the most reliable. That's what Canvas will say is best. But Firefox is fine. Safari is fine. Even Internet, Internet Explorer can, can work fine. Um, I find that, uh, of course, I do kind of some more behind the scenes stuff. I find that, I, that Google Chrome is, is the best. But there are a few things that Firefox works better for me on. So it depends upon the circumstances. Another approach is just to use a different computer. Maybe your um, Wi-Fi is unreliable where you live, or maybe your computer's a little bit dated. You can use maybe a compute, one of your friend's computers or a family member's computer, maybe the computer at work, or you can use one of the computers at the computer lab. We have computer labs, and your tuition dollars are, are making you eligible to use that. We have it on all three major campuses, and just bring your student ID, and you can use the computer labs there. Um, you can also, um, another idea is to make sure that uh, sometimes links in Canvas don't appear that obvious. 
And so sometimes just trying to click on something that didn't look like an active link, you'll see that it actually is an active link. I'll show you an example of that later on. Um, that can be a source of frustration for students. Uh, sometimes it's also a matter of scrolling down because uh, that's another way that kind of things seem to be hidden in Canvas in a way that may not be so helpful. Of course, if you have a continuing problem, uh, you can certainly reach out or a problem that doesn't seem to be fixable. Otherwise, you can certainly reach out to the eLearning Center. Here's a website. I am also glad to help. Um, if I didn't cause the problem, I'm probably not going to be able to fix the problem. I am not a computer guru, but I'm happy to lend my expertise expertise, limited though it may be. If you've got a laptop and you seem to be having a problem with your laptop, bring it in and I'll be glad to look it over and give you my thoughts about what might be at issue. Uh, so that's a, information about the FAQ. Here are some suggestions about how to send emails. Um, for those of y'all that haven't had me in a previous class, I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to emails. Um, I am trying to, through these courses, get you in the position so that you can be the most successful that you can be in your career. And one of those things that is so important to success is communication, especially written communication. And so it's not just a matter of you um, knowing the law, but also being able to uh, communicate the law in an accurate and professional manner and email is a big part of that so I'm going to be giving you suggestions over the course this is one area that I give you suggestions but when you send me emails that aren't professionally written um, I'm not going to draw that draw attention to it because I want to embarrass you or make you feel bad or not answer your question but I want you to get into the habit of sending those professional tightly worded emails that are very focused on a goal that, that you're trying to accomplish. So before you send emails to me or to potential employers or other faculty members, look this PowerPoint over and make sure that your email satisfies all the elements that we talk about. Um, I don't accept late assignments. We don't have a, a, a ton of assignments in this class except aside from the quizzes, um, uh, but I'd just like to flag that issue. Um, starting out uh, I explain the reason in this uh, uh, link here so if you're interested in the reason you're welcome to uh, visit there if you're thinking about law school this is a PowerPoint that might give you some information about that process I am delighted to talk to you in more detail about how law school works how law school admissions works I'm happy to be a resource for that sometimes students prefer not to use Cougar mail I get it we all have more email accounts than we know what to do with and having one more can certainly be a source of complication that you may not want to have as a result if you want to you can forward your cougar mail to your personal email address and so everything that i send to your cougar mail can end up in another account you're still however going to have to use your cougar mail sometimes because whenever you email me you're going to have to use your cougar mail but um uh, you know uh, the, the replies that I send to you can go to that personal email so that's definitely something to think about uh, that's completely your decision I won't even know if you do it but that's a, a benefit that you have I have to email you to your Cougar mail so if you send me an email from your personal email account or from your professional email account um, uh, also be sure to have in your email your Cougar Mail account so that I can send it to your Cougar Mail. And that's the policy that the college has. Let's look at Quizlet. Quizlet is a super awesome thing. I love Quizlet. I use it myself. I use it with my children. They're not college age, but they're um, high school and middle school age. And so I definitely encourage you to use Quizlet or something else. Quizlet is a free app. They will want you to pay for it, but there really is no need to pay for it. So let's talk about, this is one of these examples of one of these links that is a little hidden. This is actually a link. It looks like, gosh, the screen's blank. Something must have broke here, right? No, you actually click on this to go into Quizlet. So if this doesn't seem intuitive to you, what you're supposed to do here, pause me and write down, um, or you take a picture of this so you know what to do to get into Quizlet. So I'm gonna hit Quizlet right here. And you will go into my Quizlet account. Here is my Quizlet account. You'll see lots of different things. Um, this is for contracts. <coughs> um, 
Hannah Duncan was a student in our program um, a few years ago. She was very detail oriented, so I know that she did a very good job with these. And you'll see she has them for many of the chapters. Sonia Turner is um, a law student now, also very detail oriented. So these are very good resources for, I think, probably every single chapter in the course. And so what you can do, let's say you're working on chapter seven. Well, actually, let's pick one with a little bit more. Let's say chapter five. So we have lots of vocabulary terms here. There's various activities you can do. You can use a flashcard so you can test yourself. What is mutual assent? Um, you can flip it over. Oh, mutual assent is a meeting of the minds, consent agreement. You can also look at all the lists here. Um, you can uh, do various um, games. There's a few games to do along these lines. You can give yourself a test. You can practice uh, writing it. Lots of different activities that you can do with Quizlet. So this is something to consider um, as you prepare for tests. The interesting thing about this course, and this is true for most paralegal courses, is that it's almost like a foreign language course. If you um, somehow or another tomorrow morning wake up and you've somehow or another learned in your sleep all of the vocabulary that we have in this course, you'd probably find that this course is embarrassingly easy because the challenge is, is understanding the words. Once you've got the words under control, the rest of it is pretty seamless. You know, it's a little bit like, uh, I have very limited Spanish skills, but when I watch a Spanish telenovela, I catch about every third word. I get the gist of it, but I don't really understand it deeply. I mean, I, I mean obviously the, the, the way that the drama presents, you can figure out most of it. But if I, when I put the English subtitles up or even the Spanish subtitles up on the telenovela, I completely understand everything that's happening. That's way how it may feel for you in the contracts class. It, you, you, once you master the vocabulary, everything seems to fit nicely. But it's a little bit like watching a Spanish telenovela if you're not fluent in Spanish because you need to constantly say, okay, she, in that last sentence, Groover used three words. I don't know what they mean. And that can be a real impediment. So it's useful for you to work on the vocabulary early in the semester so that you can learn that material. And so when I talk in class, it makes sense. When you read it in the textbook, it makes sense. And of course, when I'm saying I talk about it in class, I mean in the taped lectures, I talk about it. Another thing about this class, and this is related to vocabulary, is that, you know what, our brains are not designed to learn a lot of vocabulary. My guess is we've probably all taken a foreign language course, and if you're like me, you probably had a few days where you were maybe cramming the night before. And it's really hard to learn 40 new French words or 40 new Japanese words. Um, in one evening. Part of the reason it's hard is that our brains are designed to move things from short-term memory, uh, from short-term memory to long-term memory through the sleep process. During the sleep process, our brain is still working hard. And one of the things it's doing is reorganizing all the data that it's received during the day and moving what it needs to move into long-term memory. Well, if I try to learn 40 words the night before, I only have one period of sleep where the, those 40 words can be moved from short-term memory to long-term memory. It's just not enough time. But let's say I spent two hours memorizing those words. If I instead spent 20 minutes a day for the six days before then, in other words, the equivalent still of two hours, but actually had six periods of sleep, um, I'm going to find that I have a much higher retention rate of those 40 words than if I had just done it in the one night. And so for that reason, it's a good idea to go ahead and uh, space it out over time. It's working smarter rather than harder. And again, the lectures are going to make more sense and be more meaningful once you learn the vocabulary terms. Okay. Here's that extra credit that I was talking about. So I'm going to go into LinkedIn. Actually, maybe I have a link here to LinkedIn. You'll see that this extra credit opportunity usually is going to close around the end of the semester. Okay, let me go into LinkedIn. So I'm going to type in linkedin.com because I already have an account established. It's going to take me directly into my account. If you're in a computer that you're not logged in, you're going to need to log in and get yourself all set up. Obviously, I'm already a member of our group, so Collin College Paralegal Association is our group. I'm just going to go ahead and click on this. 
and you'll see lots of different postings we had. We'll see it's primarily job postings, but there are a few other things. For example, I'm inviting people to join the Paralegal Advisory Committee. I provided information about the Texas Bar. Um, there's some information about legal writing, but most of it is about um, various and sundry uh, openings. Uh, even if you're not interested, though, in uh, a paralegal position at this time, please still go ahead and join the group. Once you make a request to join this group, and it is a closed group, I will be able to come in and uh, we don't have any current requests to join, but I'd be able to um, uh, yeah, uh, allow you to join the group and then you become a member. So let's say you don't have a LinkedIn account at this point in time. The first thing you need to do to join our group is you have to have a LinkedIn account. It's completely free. There's no reason to ever pay for LinkedIn. They will want you to pay just like the Quizlet people want you to pay, but don't, don't do it. Um, once you've established your account, then you're going to go into search and you're going to type in Colin College Paralegal Association right here. Um, again, I'm already a member, so it's not going to work. And what it'll tell you, since you're not a member at this point, is it'll say, ah, this is a closed group. You can't go into the group yet, but you can request membership. And then that's when I will have the opportunity to go ahead and wave you into membership. LinkedIn can sometimes be prickly, though. Sometimes the systems don't work quite right. And so if you have any difficulty joining our LinkedIn group, there are a couple of, or there, there's one other way that you can go about joining the group. And that is, after you've set up your account, you can type in Cynthia Groover right here and enter into my account. And what you'll see here, right here, is you'll say, um, uh, connect, I think is what I'll say. Let me just actually pick somebody. Here's somebody who I'm not currently connected to. If I wanted to connect with Paul Elliott, I would click on this and Paul would get an email saying, Cynthia Ferris Groover wants to connect with you. And he'd probably say yes. And so then we'd be connected, but he could say no. I won't say no to you, I promise. <laughs> I will say yes uh, to your request. And once we are linked, then you're going to ask me, hey, Groover, I'm having difficulty getting into a group. Can you send me an invitation? I can't send invitations to people who are not, um, uh, who, to whom I am not linked. Um, but once we're linked, I can send you an invitation to join. I'll, I'll send you that note. Let me just go back and show you what that's like. Uh, here we go. I'm going to my manage groups. You can see I'm able to invite members. So I would be able to invite, um, uh, you know, we'll say Lisa Abbott. I could click on her and send her an invitation. Um, she, I'm not going to because she's not a paralegal person. But um, once we're linked, I would be able to send you an invitation. I'll go to your email, and then you'd be able to click in and join the group. So that is how um, you go about joining the group. Once you've joined the group, now you're going to take this content right here, copy it. You're going to hit Submit Assignment. You're going to paste this here. Then you're going to go and put your name in here. Let's say that I know you as Bubble Smith but your real name is Lucille Smith. And that's, of course, the name you're gonna use in uh, LinkedIn. Well, you'll have to type Lucille Smith here because if you say Bubble Smith, I will go into LinkedIn, there won't be a Bubble Smith. Well, this person lied to me, they didn't really establish an account. So that's why I give you the option of typing your name in here. Um, if there's lots of Lucille Smiths, you might want to say, let's say your middle name is uh, Tabitha, Lucille Tabitha Smith. Well, there's probably only one Lucille Tabitha Smith out there. So that makes it relatively easy for me to find you. And so that's how you would go about doing this. Then at the bottom, you'd hit submit. And if you're not sure that you spelled everything correctly, you can go back here, make sure it's all correct. If it's not, then you can resubmit at that point in time. So that's how you go about completing that uh, extra credit assignment. If you're already a member of LinkedIn, you can do that today. So if you're already a member, my suggestion is stop me right now, go ahead, go into Canvas and um, 
uh, submit that assignment or uh, make a notation in your spiral notebook that you want to go ahead and join LinkedIn and the group and then you're going to submit the activity um, you have a long time to do it but uh, might as well do it now rather than later if you have a particular question for the instructor, you certainly can send me an email, but if you think it's one that's of general interest to the class, I encourage you to go ahead and post it here, and that way everyone will be able to see the question and the response. I have in our next, so this is our first module, the orientation module, I have another section here which is aids for contract law. Um, I will refer to these during the lectures in class. Um, these are some resources that can be very helpful. Um, but whenever, some of these are things that I've created, some of these are things that um, are from various and sundry uh, resources. And as you can imagine, just like kind of any other intellectual endeavor, different people have different vocabulary that they might use. And so some of these are going to use terms in a little bit different way than perhaps I use in class. And that doesn't mean they're wrong. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It's just kind of a different approach to it. So sometimes you might find it a bit confusing. If you start getting into one of these resources and they're using these terms differently and you find it disconcerting or, or you're not quite sure how to handle that information, step away from it. Don't worry about it. These are here to be helpful. When they stop being helpful is the time to move to something else. The bottom item here is I have spent, excuse me, Spanish words for common legal, English legal terms. Many students may find that this is helpful, especially if they are a supporting clients who also speak Spanish or may be more comfortable using Spanish. And so these, this can be a good resource for you. They're not specifically contract law oriented. They can apply really to any practice area. So something to keep in mind. The next category is legal writing or legal grammar topics. And I say legal, I just really shouldn't, it's just English grammar stuff. You, we will be using this throughout the course. One of the things about contract law that is so important is that every word that you write in a contract, every comma, every space, whether it's plural or singular, all of those things impact the way the court is going to interpret the contract. There is really no document um, it, other than contracts or, or that is more important that you be very, very precise than contracts. Wills would also fit in this category. These are documents that have inherent legal effect. And so it's really, really important that you understand the rules. Uh, there are cases out there where the misplacement of a comma has cost uh, a, a client means a dollar. So this is a big deal stuff. Getting this stuff right is really, really important. And so we do cover a fair number of grammar topics. And every single chapter includes a little bit of grammar, plus we have, um, in a later chapter, a more concentrated uh, focus on grammar. So here's the overall approach that we're going to have on grammar. And you can see here we have um, topics. Oh, here we go. Let me so we have, um, in our first module, we're going to cover topics one and two. Let's say you, you watch these two lectures, and each one is just about five minutes long. If actually, this one you can see, this is only going to be three and a half minutes, and this is two minutes long. So it's, in combination, they're about five minutes long. Let's say you look at these and you go, you know what, I'm not quite sure I've gotten about collective nouns. But you may want to use some of these additional resources to, to deepen your knowledge. Let me go to module one and show you how that's all set up. So under chapter one or module one, you'll see that I have the um, uh, noun basics uh, uh, SAT grammar boot camp here. And then I also have a, a worksheet for you to complete. It's not for a grade. You don't ever have to complete it. And if you really feel like you are very, very comfortable with mastering this topic, then you probably don't need to complete it. But um, sometimes it's easy when you're passively watching a lecture for everything to seem to be making sense. And it really isn't making sense in as deep a way as it needs to. And so I encourage you to go ahead and complete this form. Let me just show you what it looks like. Again, there's no need to submit it. There's no opportunity really to submit it. So you'll answer these few questions and then you will go and look at the key. The key is right below it and you'll see how many you got right. If you got 
the, the vast majority of them right, you're probably in good shape. If there's a few that you missed, but you understand why you missed it, you're still in good shape. If you aren't quite sure why you missed the ones that you missed, come see me. I'll be glad to support and give you assistance in that matter. So that's the grammar topic. There is no grading associated with it within this module, but it will be graded or there will be questions on this on both the midterm and the final examination and these are actually the most commonly missed questions by students so definitely definitely pay attention to this do this every single week okay so before you watch the lectures and you can see here i have two lectures you're going to want to give a peek at this quiz um, let me first of all uh, let me just read you the name of it because it's a little bit confusing not for a grade password quiz for chapter one. You may say, well, what do I care about a quiz that's not for a grade? Well, it's not for a grade directly. What you're gonna do is, well, let me just open up so you can see what it says here. Let me just show you what the questions are. You have to leave student view here. For a second, I'm gonna leave student view and I will show you a preview of the questions. So the first question is, in chapter one, the instructor explains the com that, that the common law puts great emphasis upon fairness, predictability, and evolution. In the next slide, she adds that consist she adds that consistency is, and she provides a symbol. That symbol is, and you're going to write that word here, whatever that symbol is, and then you're going to pick one of these uh, choices here. Okay, so this is designed to make sure that you watch the lectures. One of my concerns and one of the things that the ABA wants me to do is make sure that you're actually participating fully in class. There will be the temptation sometimes for you to just read the chapter in the book and not watch the lecture. Uh, but the reason that the ABA has approved us to have these online courses is because they know that they can count on us to deliver as close to that face-to-face -face traditional classroom experience as possible. And for that reason, I am uh, going to have these password questions. And if you uh, read the chapter in the textbook, but don't actually watch the lectures, in most cases, you're not going to be able to figure out what the answer to these questions are. But what you're going to do is you're going to know what the questions are, then you can watch the lectures. And when we get to that pay place where it's talking about consistency, you'll look and you'll say, oh, yeah, that's the answer. You'll make a notation at that point. Once you're done with the lectures, you'll go back and you'll answer those quiz, those questions. Again, this won't count towards a grade, but what it'll do is unlock these two activities. After you've got it unlocked, you can take the uh, you can take the chapter one assignment, and you can also take chapter one quiz. Now, the chapter one assignment, there's really no rush on. That will be due at the end of the semester, but the chapter one quiz you have to do that week. So if you don't watch the lecture, you're probably not going to be successful in the password quiz, and so therefore you're not going to be able to take that quiz. Missing one quiz is not a tragedy. We're gonna have, I think about 16 quizzes and each quiz I think is maybe, let me just confirm this, is maybe, twenty percent of your grade. So each quiz is worth a little bit more than one percent. Not even gonna affect your, your performance by a letter grade. But if you miss three or four or five of these quizzes, you're gonna start seeing an impact. And so for that reason, don't panic if you, you can't complete a particular a quiz. Don't panic if you can't complete two, but at some point you're gonna to wanna to, to figure it out and be sure that you can get your password quiz answers taken care of. And that way you'll be able to open these up and go ahead and complete the quizzes. Okay. Um, so you're going to watch this uh, or look at the, give a peek to the password quiz, then watch the lectures. Let me go back to the student view. So you're going to uh, give a peek to the quiz, watch the lectures. There, I also have the PowerPoint available for you. And I have the PowerPoint um, for the first chapter in PDF as well. You can. Um, the rest of them are just going to be in, in the a Microsoft PowerPoint application, but you can change it to a PDF if you want. 
then we'll have a discussion board for those weeks that we do have a discussion board and finally we have those grammar activities and then once you pass the password quiz you'll have access to these two items and that's the pattern throughout the rest of the um, uh, material down to after chapter eight we're going to have the midterm here's information about the midterm um, and here are some additional resources for working on those grammar issues um, the midterm is going to be about 10 percent devoted to grammar issues and they are the most common issues that we miss so in addition to the help that's provided in each one of the chap in each one of the modules you have some additional resources that are available here um, for support and again you're welcome to come see me for additional support uh, sometimes these grammar topics can be tricky they're important they're important to master uh, both for the test as well as just for you professionally but um, especially if, if that isn't hasn't been your strong point or you uh, maybe haven't attended grammar school in many years you may need quite a bit of a refresher to get back on track with these items we also have some additional uh, grammar and style issues that we cover in chapter 17 and in some sense chapter 18. And then our final chapter is chapter 19. We cover all the chapters in the textbook with the exception of chapter 16. That is an extra credit chapter that you're welcome to do if you would like. And then here's some information to prep you for the final examination. I also have resources, just kind of general legal and paralegal related resources that you might find of interest here. Um, at this point, I'm going to um, briefly cover, I guess I'm thinking I'm going to be able to cover all of our topics, which is awesome. I'm going to go into the PowerPoint. I've covered most of the topics I want to do in the PowerPoint uh, throughout the presentation, so I'm going to jump through many of these topics relatively quickly. Of course, if you want to go back and look at this PowerPoint in more detail, it is posted in the orientation material, so spend more time with it as you see appropriate. And of course, if you have questions, come by and see me. I'll be glad to talk with you in more detail about these topics. Uh, welcome. Hopefully I've said this before. Um, I'm delighted to teach this course. I find contracts very, very interesting. It's interesting when I talked to uh, Professor Wagoner um, in the previous uh, uh, full-time instructor we had, Professor Griggs, when she was here, both Professor Wagner and Professor Griggs prefer torts. I like torts. I really do like torts, but I have to say I really love contracts, so I'm so delighted to be able to teach this course. I hope that I'm able to convey some of my enthusiasm for this topic um, over the course of the semester. As always, if you have questions about the material, either about how the course is set up or specifically about the topics that we're going to be covering, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll be glad to provide whatever assistance I can. If you haven't met me before, this is what I look like. I don't have bangs right now, but this gives you an overview. Um, I have been an attorney since 1990, so I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in the legal profession. I uh, initially worked for a large law firm that's based in Houston called Baker Botts, and then I went to work for a corporation in Plano, uh, that's J.C. Penney. Uh, most of my career, I practiced labor and employment law. Um, I've also been a litigator, both in the labor and employment law area and other just kind of general commercial litigation. I joined college, Colin, in 2010, and um, I teach paralegal courses mainly, but I also do teach business law, hospitality law, and employment practices. Employment practices is an HR law course for HR managers. So that kind of gives you an overview about me. Um, my office, as we've already talked about, is an L232. Um, come to see me when you need help with course materials, but I'm also glad to provide help with professional goals, uh, with educational goals, such as law school, um, and also with resume help. Here's the textbook. We already talked about that. Uh, you do need to watch the lectures. Um, the lectures will cover Texas-specific information in many cases that you'll be responsible for, so definitely take that seriously. And of course, you'll have to watch the lectures to get the passwords to be able to get into the assignments. I encourage you to kind of one, spend maybe 20, 30 minutes kind of wandering around campus to get acclimated to find out where everything is. Again, that cheat sheet function um, in the orientation module is also very, very helpful. 
Here's some, an orientation guide. If you haven't taken an online course before, you're not that familiar with Canvas, this can be really helpful. If you haven't already, be sure to read that syllabus. Um, we already talked about the fact that I don't accept late assignments. Visit at least twice a week um, our classroom, um, and you should visit it by at least Tuesday. When you visit on Tuesday, if you can go ahead and um, make that first post for our discussion board in weeks that we have a discussion board, that would be really helpful because we need uh, posts to have people to respond to posts. So that, thank you for doing that. You have to make your first response by noon on Saturday, so that would be the last time. Uh, or actually, you can do it after then, but you will get a deduction by for waiting too long. I'm not one to really remind you about deadlines a lot. I do send a weekly email out to folks. Um, but um, one of the things about being a legal professional is you've got a lot of deadlines in your life. And courts and opposing counsel don't always tell you about how, what the date is that the responses do. And so you have to find the rule that tells you the date. You have to do the math and you have to be sure you meet that deadline. I'm going to give you the dates. I'm going to make it a little easier than the, our court system uh, will will assist you. Uh, so there's more help here than, than out in the cold, cruel world. But at the end of the day, it's much better to mess up here when you aren't um, committing professional malpractice, when you're not in danger of getting fired if you mess up, uh, than it is to mess up when you, once you are a legal professional. And so consider this a safe area where you can make mistakes and you can learn from those mistakes. Uh, but you can't make mistakes if I don't give you the, the opportunity to make the mistakes. And so I'm not going to constantly be saying, hey, you know what, 20 more minutes before you, so you can submit that assignment. Things are going to happen with your computer. If you're like me, you have bad computer karma. Things are always crashing on mine. So be sure to budget time in uh, so that you'll have the opportunity. Uh, my rule of thumb is if something is due on a Sunday, I'm going to make sure I'm done by Friday but certainly by Saturday, because things can happen, and I don't want to be uh, left in a position where I can't get the things done that I need to get done. Certainly life happens, and there are times where you're going to have to do things on Sunday, but the plan ought to be to get things done well in advance of the deadline. Here are some, uh, this is, uh, and I showed you where the email communication uh, PowerPoint is, but here are a few things to keep in mind when you send an email. Look at that too, but here are some things to get yourself started. First of all, you're going to want to have two things in your subject line when you're emailing me or really any faculty member. The first thing is you're going to want to say what the uh, reason for the email is, and then you're going to want to include the, the course. I happen to teach six or seven courses most semesters. And many of the topics in this course I'll have in other courses. For example, I teach business law. Guess what? A lot of business law is contracts. So you can't say something like, have a question about consideration. And I'm not immediately going to know whether which course you are in of mine. And sometimes I have more than one section of a course. And so that further complicates the subject. So you're, you'll want to say what it is. Maybe it's a question about uh, question 14 on the chapter three assignment. Okay, fair enough. And then you um, uh, indicate the course. That's how you want to go about establishing your subject line. Then you'll want to start with the professional greeting. It's good to start with dear, a professor or Ms. Groover will work fine, and then a colon here. A colon tells the recipient this is a professional communication. When you're emailing your significant other or family or friend, you're going to use a comma, uh, but not when you're emailing your potential boss or your uh, instructor. Then you'll want to include a complete and thorough explanation of whatever your question is, and you're obviously going to make sure there aren't any typos in it. And then you're going to conclude it with, a, with your name and contact information. Read it over and anticipate the questions that somebody might have. You might want to include a screenshot in some cases so that I can see what you're seeing if there's a technical issue. Generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is think about what type of response that you would want. So if you send me an email like, I just don't understand, con I don't understand consideration. Can you explain it to me? Think to yourself, well, if Groover's two hour long lecture in the chapter in the textbook didn't answer your questions, 
is it likely that an email is going to do that, especially when you haven't explained what about consideration is confusing you? So think about what that response would look like and whether that's a reasonable response. A good rule of thumb is if your anticipated response is longer than three sentences, you probably need to have a conversation with a person because there can be a give and take and I can get a better sense as to what about consideration is throwing you for a loop and I can ask you a question then you can answer and then we can get down to the particular issue that you're concerned about and I can get feedback from you does that make sense well no it doesn't well let me give you an example oh yeah that makes more sense but what about this oh well let me tell you how that would work a give and take back and forth that's a conversation and that's something that email just doesn't do for us so many times the most successful email message isn't the one that gets you the final answer but the one that sets up an opportunity opportunity for the two parties to talk over the telephone or meet to resolve the issue in more detail. Here's a breakdown of the grades. We've already talked about that, so I won't go over that more. And this is an overview of what to do each week in terms of the assignments. Again, this is like that cheat sheet function that we showed before. If you don't think you'll use a cheat sheet, you may want to take a picture of this slide, slide 22. Um, this is a good idea to pause and to go ahead and, and take a picture of this so you'll have this for your records with you. And you might want to look at this every single week to make sure you're doing all the different tasks. We've talked about the midterm already and the final examination. Uh, we've talked about class participation, the discussion board. All discussion boards, by the way, close at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday. Occasionally, I'll make an adjustment if there's a holiday, but um, that's a good rule of thumb to check. And you'll, you'll be able to see the due dates right below each one of the activities, so you'll be able to see when you need to go ahead and complete it. I think I've covered... Let's say that you uh, do a particular assignment or quiz and you're curious to see why you missed a certain question. I'm delighted to sit down with you and go over all the questions that you would like. It's very common for students to come and those are wonderful questions and conversation starters. I do not, however, do that by email. You're welcome to come uh, to my virtual office hours or face-to-face -face or call me over the phone and we can talk through all of the different uh, questions to get your questions answered. Here's um, uh, some information again about some of those technical solutions to problems. Slide 34 you might want to take a picture of as well so that you'll have that in the event you're having problems accessing something in Canvas. I'm going to, sh before we end, before we have that great semester, let me just show you a couple more things. Um, here is where you click on to get your grade, or well, for, well, first of all, this is where you find the various activities that are due. Now most of the stuff in our course are going to be due at the very end um, because all of the uh, um, assignment activities are due at the end. The extra credit is going to be due at the end. Um, the discussion boards are going to be due each week. You'll see the date directly below and the quizzes will be due each week. You'll be able to see the dates over here as well. And you can go to the calendar feature and see the dates here. So let me just show you what that looks like. You'll see in this particular class they're in green. And you'll see most weeks will have two or three activities. Here's two, here's three, here's two, here's one for this particular week. Um, it's a smart idea to calendar all of this early on so you'll be able to plan for it. Another good idea, and you may want to pause right now, is to go ahead and plan for the time that you're going to set aside each week to work on memorizing the vocabulary terms. I suggest at least two or three times a week, ideally every day, where you might spend 10, 15, 20 minutes. Every, you know, some people are better at memorizing terms than others. You know your own strengths, so you know how much time you need to, to spend on it. Uh, set aside that time, kind of consider it um, something that, that's sacrosanct that you're not going to fiddle around with. Alternatively, you can have it available on Quizlet so when you're in line at the grocery store or you're riding the bus to work and you've got some extra time um, or you're on your lunch hour, your, your coffee break, and you can flip to these resources and uh, go ahead and go through the terms at that point in time. 
again, it's more important you do it often than you spend a particular number of hours on it. I'm going to go back to our course. And here is where you'll find the grades. Let me show you this too. You'll see all of the grades. This information here is very accurate. All of it will, it should be 100% accurate. Uh, down here though, um, sometimes I, I, I put into the equations or put into the system um, the various percentages. Let's see if I've done that here. Looks like I have. Sometimes I don't. Even when I do put in the percentages saying, ah, oh, discussion boards are worth 5%, assignments are worth whatever percentage. Even when I do that, Canvas is not going to give you a completely correct answer. It just won't. It doesn't, it's not robust enough to do that. Um, there's lots of aspects of how I do grades. It's a little bit more complicated than what Canvas can handle. So this information below the last assignment is honestly kind of garbage. If I could turn it off, I would because it's a source of more confusion and anxiety than it is help. But you don't need to look at this. And my suggestion is for you to ignore this. So I'm going to ask that you pause and write down your notebook. Ignore everything below online chapter 19 quiz assignment. Um, you'll have all of this lovely data here. And you can actually calculate your grade on your own because you have the formula right here. Let me go back and show you. It's on the syllabus too. Here it is. So what you'll do is you'll take all of your discussion board grades. If you didn't participate in a particular week, you'll want to take that as a zero. Find the average. Um, if it's on a 10 point scale, you'll want to uh, half that average. If it's, not, if it's on a five point scale, I can't remember if it's a five point scale or a 10 point scale. If it's on a five point scale, you're good to go. For assignments, each assignment is worth 32 points. You'll take the average of all of your assignments, obviously including one that you got zeros on, and that will be your assignment grade. And you can see you can go through and do each one of these parts. At the end of the day, you aren't responsible for calculating your grade. That's my job. And so if you find the math daunting or boring to do, you don't have to calculate your grades at all. But many times students are interested in knowing how they're performing in the class. So if you'd like to come by, I will be glad to sit down with you and work with you on how to calculate your grade. Just come to my office hours. I don't do that via email. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to help you a little bit if we're doing it by phone or virtual offices, but honestly, it's much, much better to do face-to-face -face because we'll be writing numbers down and going through various scenarios and that's a little bit um, awkward to do when we're not in a face-to-face -face situation. But at the end of the day, it's my job to do this, not yours, so please don't worry about it. One thing I will say, I'm glad to help folks with this, but I don't help folks with this during the last two weeks of the semester, the week before finals and the week of finals. And it's just a really busy time for both you and me, and at that point, um, there's, uh, you know, kind of your grade is what it's going to be. Um, whether you know what your grade is or not doesn't impact um, how you're going to do on the test or or, or whatever the, the thing is. And you'll get your grade soon enough. It'll be the week after the, the final that you'll be able to see your posting. If you think I've miscalculated your grade in some way, then reach out to me after you see your final examination, or excuse me, your final overall grade posted on um, uh, Cougar Web, and I'll be glad to sit down with you and crunch the numbers. Um, I'm very, very careful. So it's quite unlikely there's an error, but certainly I'm not infallible. And so if there is an error, I'll be glad to fix that under those circumstances. Okay, so here you'll see all of your grading information. Let's go to announcements. I'll be sending out at least one announcement a week, and most of my announcements are going to be kind of like, um, let's just look at this one. Here's an example of a takeaways from a, for a particular chapter. Um, I have these kind of set up, but I also um, will uh, 
uh, tweak them to reflect what we're doing in this particular semester. So I kind of give you an overview about what the high points of the chapter are. You can see here I say, although these chapters cover two of the four elements of contracts, these two elements are conceptually relatively easy to grasp. We're going to be talking about some specific issues about Texas law that are not covered in the textbook, so you want to pay particular attention to those. Uh, we're going to be talking about five different scenarios. You want to be sure that you understand the similarities and differences between these five. And um, we'll talk about um, some statutory limitations. I've listed these here too. So it kind of gives you an overview, hopefully a schema or a paradigm in which to look at these in more detail. Um, and so this is a helpful thing to look at even before you look at this that first lecture. Um, I encourage you to uh, read these announcements. Typically you will see them on Monday. But if they're missing um, or you don't have an opportunity to see them, there's nothing in those announcements that you won't be able to also gather from the lecture in the textbook. So at this point, I think that we're done. Again, it's been my pleasure covering this material with you. I look forward to a wonderful semester. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thanks so much for your attention. Have a wonderful day.